Hey, good morning. Good morning. I hope you are ready for a fan. Did you know it's World Sun World Party Day? I just come up with these things, and it's all good. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, so it's World Party Day, so we're going to act like it. And we're going to act like we're, we're glad to be here and thankful. I mean, we're not going to act. Maybe we really are glad to be here. How about that? Uh, and uh, anyways, we're going to take a second. Can we play some music? We're going to we'll just give fist bumps and elbow and, and, and greet one another just for about 30 seconds. We haven't done this since before COVID, and this to me signifies World Party Day. Play some music, stand up please, and just tell somebody you're happy to, that they're here. All right. All right. Well, thanks for being here. A um, couple things. First of all, if you're here for the first time, thank you for coming. Um, we have some color cards right in front of you. They signify three things. The first thing uh, is a the Navy card, get to know you kind of thing. Um, just, where's my daughter? That's weird. Um, oh, yeah, the Navy. Thank you. The Navy card uh, t signifies we'd love to fill it out and get it to us, and we will and we will uh, reach out to you. Uh, then there's an the orange card. If you're interested in volunteering for something, please let us know that, and we can get back to you uh, on that. And the black card helps us to know, or if you've taken a step towards saying yes to Jesus, we would love to uh, reach out to you and connect in that way as well. So that's why we're here. And so, uh, finally, Chaffin Good News. Here's some Chaffin. She just left, but that's okay. She might say something too. Chaffin Good News. Um, there she is. Hi. Uh, Chaffin Good News states that Alba uh, is happy that she was able to find an apartment this week. So let's celebrate with Alba. She was in a kind of a bond. So that was an awesome thing. So, celebration, that's where we're at today. Uh, kids, if you would like, let's come forward, sit in the front, and uh, Mr. Dan Cohane is going to read our story. We only have two or three more of these of Kika and Xander. Thank you, sir. Hey, guys. Good morning. All right, um, and just to catch up real briefly, last week, if you missed it, uh, Jesus had his trial, and Kiki and Xander saw him at the end of his trial, and he was all beat up, and he was, he was a mess, and it really got them sad. And right before, when they pronounced him guilty, and he was going to be crucified, Mikey the angel came, opened the portal, and they jumped in. That's where we left off last week. So... Kika and Xander found themselves in the upstairs room in the church attic. Directs, and just to explain, that's where the hole was. That's how they found this portal. In the first place. Direct sunlight hit them both as they laid down on the cold wooden floor. It felt nice for several seconds. They didn't move. They didn't want to move or think or talk or do anything. They had just seen Jesus taken away to be crucified, and they couldn't help but cry in response. Before, it had only been a Bible story or a lesson. But now it was real, and they did not like it at all. After a minute of silence, Kika jumped up with a lagging tear in her eyes and a smile on her face. I have an idea, she said. Follow me. She stood up and quickly ran out of the room, hurtling a few old books on the way. Xander, realizing she was leaving him behind, stood up and ran out the door, too. They ran to the steep wooden stairs and then down them. Their footsteps on the wood sounded like wild horses stampeding across an old prairie. Running down the hall into a storage room, Kika ran into her dad's office. Dad, 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 she yelled with shortness of breath. 
Their dad was studying for Easter Sunday service, and he smiled as they ran into the room. Hey, kids, he said, smiling. You up in the Bible Bounce room? Peter and Xander told their parents about their first journey with Mikey the Angel when they came home, and since then, each time they took a trip to the Bible Bounce, they shared each detail of their journey with their parents. Their parents loved their imagination. Dad, you have to help us, Keith had said intensely. We, but especially Jesus, need your help. Whoa there, kids, hold up. Jesus needs my help? Yes, Dad, Xander chimed in. Jesus is about to be crucified, and he needs our help. Come on. Kids, Jesus was crucified. He died on a cross, and that, I'm sorry to say, is important to his son. Keith got interrupted, frustrated with Dad's initial unwillingness to help. What's important is that you come with us. We need to get some guns and maybe a tank or two and get those things inside the Bible bounce. And, Daddy, we can change things. We can save Jesus before those bad men hurt him or kill him. Tears rolled down her face again. Their dad grabbed them both and hugged them tightly. Listen, he said compassionately. We don't save Jesus. He saves us. If he wanted to, he could have stopped his crucifixion and his pain and his beating. He could have snapped his finger and beat them back. He could have called thousands of angels and they would have come and taken him off the cross or saved him from all that pain or even the arrest. But he didn't. Why not, Daddy? said the rest. The kids asked why. He came to give his life, to show us that life doesn't have to be all about us, but there's more, more to this life. You guys told me that you saw the creation of the world, right? Yeah, that was awesome, Keith said. And when you did, when you saw everything perfect, and then you saw the sweet relationship between God and Adam and Eve, then because Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate of the fruit of the tree, that close relationship was broken. God had to bridge that gap between good and evil. So he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to bridge that gap by offering up his life to the world. He gave his love away. The only way that one can really give it away, by offering himself. Then we are called to follow his example and love other people, even when it hurts. But Daddy, he could cry into his side. I don't want him to hurt anymore. I don't want him to die. Then you should finish the story, my sweet kid, because death is not the end of the story. Isn't death always the end of the story, Daddy? Kika asked, puzzled. I'm only eight, and I know that sounds. Their dad laughed. Sometimes that's what it feels like, especially when you lose somebody you love. But death is never the end of the story. There's always a sequel. So what do we do now? Xander whispered. Go back to the Bible bounce. Learn as much about him as possible. and come back and tell others why he's important. What is it about this man that changed the world, that's changing your life? Okay, Daddy, but we'd rather still have you with us. Those Roman soldiers are scared. Oops. Their dad smiled and sent them off, and they walked back up to the attic. Slower than the trip down the stairs, they walked across the floor to the little room in the back. They breathed heavily as their damp faces began to dry. As they walked into the room, a bright lighted ball hovered in the middle, and they smiled. The ball opened up and became a portal, and they jumped in. Kika and Xander dropped into nothing, waiting for God to put them where he wanted them. Kika stood up. It was dark all around, but all around her were people looking upwards, some quietly observing, others shouting, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. She found an opening where she could see what was happening, and she saw Jesus hanging on a cross. Two men were also on the crosses on either side of him. One of the men looked mad at Jesus. He looked over at him and said, so, you're the king, are you? I think now would be a good time to prove it by doing what they are saying and saving yourself. And while you're at it, save us too, would you? The man on the other side of Jesus yelled back, Don't you care even when you've been sentenced to die? We're guilty. We committed crime. This man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus looked softly at the man and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Then Jesus began to struggle for breath. Kika started crying again. She sh couldn't believe how much she'd come to love this man who was hurting so badly right now. Then he spoke, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He looked at Kika with such love in his eyes, and she realized how much he loved her. Then he closed his eyes, and she knew he was gone. Xander, I'm so sad right now. She looked around for Xander and realized that he was with her.
back to your seats and we're going to Everyone, feel free to stand on up, join in musical worship. Uh, just a reminder, told us it is uh, National Party Day. So, so feel free to, to make it a party as much as you guys like it. Take two with the guitar on.
Inspired by the book of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Though Jesus had no home of his own when he began to travel and teach, there were a few places that he frequently stayed at. One was the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Uh, come in, come in. We want to hear everything. Stay as long as you like. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in the town of Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem. But the last time that Jesus had been in Jerusalem, it didn't end so well with the religious leaders. My sheep listen to my voice. My Father who has given them to me is greater than anyone. I and the Father are one. He just claimed to be God. What an evil thing to say. The 
leaders actually picked up stones threatening to kill Jesus. Jesus knew this was not the time to confront them, so he and his friends left and crossed over the Jordan River. While they were gone, Lazarus became very sick. I, I just need to lie down. Oh, he's burning up. We need cool water. I'll sit with him tonight. But Lazarus didn't get better. He became more and more feverish and restless. So hot. Mary and Martha became so worried about their brother that they sent a messenger after Jesus. All right, kids, go ahead and head downstairs if you're interested. Kindergarten through fifth grade. Kindergarten through fifth grade. Good morning again. Hey, now that they're gone, I got to tell you. You guys got to lighten up a little bit. There's like this heaviness up in the house. Like everything's like, uh. so just like, let's, whoo. Maybe it's me. I don't know. Anyways, um, something I was going to say to start off here. It's going to be good. I can't remember. So, um, we're going to have communion today, just a uh, word of warning, uh, and I say that because if there's anything uh, you're going through, if there's anything you need, like inside, if there's anything you need to go to God about, go to God about it, and, uh, and kind of uh, get ready, prepare yourself for uh, communion. Uh, anybody like to work hard? Thanks. That's awesome. Working hard, right? Working hard is great. It is important. Uh, however, one of the things that Paul and others in Scripture completely clear about is that working hard is not going to bring salvation to your life. Okay, that is clear as day in Scripture. That there is nothing about you working hard. That is, you could go to the, you could go to the gym this week, like, eight times in seven days and it would profit you a little bit but it would do nothing for the salvation of your soul for instance like there's nothing that would that would um, connect you like you could you could try to work really hard at any number of things maybe with finances or maybe with uh, maybe with your physical health or maybe at your job and at the end of the day you're going to be no closer or farther away from God as you were before just because you worked hard in that particular thing. Even if you worked, check this out, even if you worked hard at scripture memory verses, right? Where you get like, like if you, if you got really, really good at memorizing scripture. Now that's not a bad thing, but you would be no closer to God because you worked hard at memorizing scripture or being a worked hard at being a good boy or a good girl. Anybody work hard at that in their life? I went to Pensacola Christian College. You don't get trying to be a good girl or a good boy. Like I knew all about it. I wore a tie until I was 24 years old. Amen? Anyway, a lot of times we come to church and then we're told to work hard, work hard in your spiritual, and, and, and God will be happy with you, right? And that is, that is basically ludicrous. Now, what's interesting is we don't even always say that, but we give off that vibe sometimes. Pastors can get off that vibe, that you need to do more, you need to do more, you need to do more. And more, and more, and more. And you're like, how much more can I do? And so I'm just going to tell you the end of this message right now. Your spiritual life, your connection with God, has nothing to do with you working harder. Zero. You don't have to sit in guilt. You don't have to sit in manipulation. You can just... Push all that aside and know that you are loved by God. You are a child of God. 
and you can sit in that fact. Now, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 3. I love this passage. Anybody love Philippians? I love Philippians. It's the book of joy. It's the book of joy. And here's what's crazy. Paul wrote it from prison. You know somebody who can write about joy if he's writing from prison? You know that that person knows about joy. Because they can write it, they can write, that he's in prison, he says, in chains, and he's exhibiting joy. I know a lot of Christians who are in, in like, who are free as a bird, who can't figure that one out. And joy, it could be a very difficult thing. In fact, we're not going to look at the whole lectionary passage. The whole lectionary passage is this, Philippians 3, 1 through 14. I'd encourage you to read it. It's a great passage. We're going to look at a short part of it. But one of the things we are going to look at, Paul talks about four things that we should, he, he gives four commands. And the first command is this, rejoice in the Lord. Right? Rejoice in the Lord. That's a really cool thing to do. And here's what he means. He means do it in the midst of hard circumstances. Man, that Paul's so irritating. You know what I like to do when I'm in the midst of hard circumstances? I like to complain. You know what I'm saying? I like to get with my boys and I like to give to their ears the blessings of my complaining. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you about how hard my life is. You have no idea. I had to wake up at four this morning. Right? Now, all of us know these things, these circumstances, these first world problems. Like some of us have really intense problems, right? And Paul, in the midst of that, says, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. Here's the second thing he says. Watch out for dogs. I think he's talking about my wheat and tear here. Watch out for dogs. Now, here's the, here's the context. What he's talking about is there were a group of people who, were, who had claimed Christ, and at the same time, they were devout Jews, which most Paul was too, but then they were connecting the two and saying, you also, as a Christian, have to do all of these other things. So Christianity was becoming burdensome. Right? Just like when you feel like there's all these things you have to do it for church, and, and, and it's not a pleasant thing anymore, and the pastor's guilting you into it. If I ever guilt you into something, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Slap me. Will Smith me, you know what I'm saying? Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> and so... He's saying, you have to watch out. He calls those people dogs. Watch out for those people. Okay, here's the third thing. Forget the past, he says. Forget the past. Oh, Paul, you're killing me here. You don't know how I like to live in my past. You know what I'm saying? How many of us like to live? How many like to live? Even if you're not complaining, you like to live in that past. Even if it's like joyful. Oh, I remember the days. Before the four kids. <laughs> I remember the days, right? I remember the days in college. I rem or it could, you could go bad. Man, things were bad. Man, uh, my life has been horrible. Oh, man. And we, and we live in those, past those past days. Forget the past, Paul says. And then, finally, he says, look forward to the future. He talks about hope. He says, you need to have hope. You need to have a Christian hope. A hope that Christ is good and that he's coming back. And that, and that over... So, these four things he says. Now, here's the interesting thing about these four things. Rejoice in the Lord. Watch out for dogs. Forget the past. Look forward to the future. It doesn't take a lot of work. There's no work involved. A lot of the things Paul talks about doesn't have anything to do with work. In other words, rejoicing in the Lord. 
It's not work. It can, can become work. But it's not intense, hard work to forget or to change our default mode of complaining and move to rejoicing in the Lord. It can be difficult, but it's not work. It's not like you're going out there and physical work. Right? None of these things are working, are, are, are intense work. And that's one of the interesting things about Paul is he's constantly pushing away. While he says, work hard in your job, while he says, work hard and do things excellently, in terms of your spiritual well-being, he always pushes away work. Now look what he says here. In... This passage, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Okay? In other words, I used to be a goody two-shoes. Now, some of you can't say that, amen? Some of you can't say that. You didn't used to be a goody two-shoes. I used to be a goody two-shoes, right? Trust me. Many of us used to be goody two-shoes. Or even sometimes we go into church mode and we become a goody two-shoes in church. And we think, okay, this is going to make me, and this is going to make God and me good. If I come into church and I'm good. Okay, we separate what's out there from in here, right? Okay. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Okay, this is a really, really popular passage of Scripture. It's a great passage of Scripture. A lot of times... It becomes difficult to really understand because people go, what, what do I do? Do I just sit here? I have faith. God and I are good. I don't have to be good. I can do whatever I want. Okay. I want, here's what Paul says, I want to know Christ. Here's where it gets intense. I want to know Christ. The Greek word for know here is gnomai. And it means to know by experience. To know by experience. Many of, this is why, now listen, because this is really important. This is why your kids' spirituality, it doesn't matter if you're spiritual as to whether or not they're spiritual. In other words, there will come a time when they will encounter Christ and that decision is going to have to be theirs. Right? In other words, you can train and train and train a child in a certain way and they can still not encounter Christ. I want to know Christ. In other words, I want to know him by experience. And experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. The word there is the Greek word dynamis, which means to overcome resistance. Okay? And experience the mighty power that overcomes resistance that raised him from the dead. In other words, the same power that allowed Jesus to be resurrected is the same power that helps you overcome resistance in your life. Okay? That's pretty intense. It's pretty deep. I want you to grab onto this. Listen to this, listen. I want, Paul is going way deep on us here. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection 
from the dead. When you tell somebody, a group of people, I want to suffer with him, that's a lot of my pay range. You know what I mean? That's like Paul, I don't know what's going on, but it feels kind of messed up. What do you mean I want to suffer? What do you mean, Paul? I want to suffer with him. And here's the thing. He first says, I want to know Christ. Most of us, as Americans, are trying to get as far away from suffering as possible. I mean, I am. I am totally good with not suffering. Right? Ain't nobody want to suffer up in the house. Right? But Paul says, I want to suffer. And here's, here's the difference. He's saying, I want to know Christ. In other words, because I have experienced Christ in the midst of suffering... Because I've experienced Christ in the midst of suffering, I want get to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. If you're a believer, you can overcome resistance. You can know Christ. And the way you know Christ is by experiencing him, not by head knowledge. That's how we transfer it to our kids every time and then some. Right now, right now, an awesome teacher is downstairs teaching our kids head knowledge. Here is what we know through the Bible, right? Right now, I am giving you what's known as head knowledge, right, about Christ. But you can't know Christ because I give you knowledge. Paul says, I want to know Christ through experience. And through what, through the extent of the experience that I have and I've come to know him, at that point, I will see the power and experience the power that he experienced when he was raised from the dead. You see, that's why people can be outside of this room and think we're crazy for being in this room. Because you can, this is why maybe some of you think we're crazy. Because you can know Christ's head knowledge. You can't be raised up uh, like I was. I knew every Bible trivia, I would definitely beat you in every Bible trivia game. Most of you. And it didn't matter. I still went, got out of college and decided I wanted to live my own way. And had to come to Christ because of an experience that I had where I was confronted with my own mortality. I was confronted with my own sinful nature. I was confronted with the fact that I didn't know everything. And all of a sudden, I realized in the midst, at the age of 21 years old, I need to know Christ by experience, not by writing it down and by, by a Bible trivia game and by a Bible test. Paul says here, I want to suffer with him because he literally was suffering with him. And as he suffered, now this is the important part, as he suffered, and many of you know this because you've suffered and you've been there and back again. As he suffered, what was happening is he was continuing to know Christ over and over and over and over again. And he was getting to know him by the experience. And through that, here's what happens. You realize you can't get through it on your own. How many of you ever gone, God, I can't get through this? Maybe it's the kids. 
Maybe it's your living situation. Maybe it's the finances. Maybe it's something, a way that you screwed up royally. And it's really intense. And you're like, I can't get through this. That is when you can get through it. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying what he said so many times. In my weakness... God takes over, and his strength allows me to get through that suffering. I want to know Christ. I want to know him. I don't just want to have a faith of head knowledge. I want to have a faith where I believe that his power can get me through all of that, all of the hard stuff. All of the stupid stuff that I do. All of the stuff, the obstacles in my way. I want a faith where his power is pushing me through. Because I realize my power cannot. This is the the, the onus of the Christian faith. It's not you you say a prayer and it's good. Lots of people have said prayers. I want to know Christ by experience. It's possible that you have found yourself, even as a Christian, starting to complain over and over and over again. I have. Complain, 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 complain. And Paul confronts that by saying, rejoice in the Lord. But the weather is bad. You don't know what I'm going through, Paul. I'm sitting in a prison. Rejoice in the Lord. And it's possible you've allowed people in your life who have added to the stress of being a Christian. And they've manipulated you. And they've said, as long as you're good with the church, you're good with God. As long as you're good with doing spiritual serving things, as long as you're out serving, you're good with God. And Paul says, no, watch out for dogs. And it's possible that you've allowed people in your life who've kept you living in the past. And you're buried there. And they're like, you're never going to be anything. That's who you are. And you've you've decided, you know what? I want to experience Christ and I need his help in forgetting the past. And it's possible you've allowed people in your life who won't let you look to God's future, whatever that is. And And you've decided, I have a future and a hope that God has for me. And people are around you going, no, 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 no. You... You can't do that. That's not what God has for you. What do you know what God has for me? Rejoice in the Lord. Watch out for dogs. Forget the past. Look forward to the future. Have a stinking hope. And you can do that. Scripture says, and Paul says that, You do that by knowing Christ through your experience, through experience, through the hard times. That's what separates. Man, there are are Christians I know, and maybe I hope you do too, that they've gone through it, and, and they just go through it like way different than anyone else. There's this lady I knew years ago. Her name was Pauline Kelly. Oh, my gosh. Pauline. She was straight up crazy. Literally, she went through m- mountains I couldn't even imagine. Riddled with cancer, she walked up and, and played the part of my mother during our wedding. And she looked at me that day and she said, Marty, you keep your eyes on Jesus. I'm like, you're riddled with cancer. What are you talking about? You're crazy. Like, I didn't say that, because that's not what you say. That's like next level stuff. That's crazy. 
But that's what people do who are knowing Christ, who know Christ through experience, not through head knowledge, through experience. And I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know what your future holds, but I do know what this. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, if you want to focus in on him, if you want to go and follow him like you've never followed him before, you, if you want to rejoice in the Lord, if you want to forget the past, if you want to know his way for your future, this, if you want to watch out for stinking dogs, you do it through faith in Christ. Not a faith where you say a prayer, and you try to be good, blah, 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 blah. But a faith that allows you to take whatever life gives you and say, your way, not my way. My weakness, your power is the only way this is going to get done. Know him through experience. There's this That's what I got. Know him through experience. Father, thank you for this passage of scripture, Philippians chapter 3. We, uh, we need, need you. We don't need to know about you, which is fine. We need to know you in the midst of good times and hard times. Help us to put, put, put our trust, our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to uh, take the Lord's Supper today. What we're going to do is just, uh, it, as I said before, it's World Party Day right? Today's World Party Day. It's a day to celebrate. So we're, on, we're coming up on Holy Week and Good Friday and Easter. And there's this beautiful tension between the sorrow we feel when we, that we feel on Good Friday and the joy we feel on Easter. Right? We don't celebrate suffering but we do celebrate and remember the effects of Jesus' suffering and that that did for the world. So today, on World Party Day, we're going to celebrate Jesus. His life, his death, his goodness, his broken body shed for us. What a joy it is to have hope where before there was none. We have hope. You have hope. As a believer, you have hope. I mean, how good is that? Go ahead and say that with me. I have hope. You do. No matter how dark and deep things seem. So this communion, I, wanna, I want you to celebrate in your heart how good God is for saving you. For giving us the gift of giving and as such, we've been asked to repeat this regularly. But this is a way to know him, right? To remember, to know him by experience. So sometimes we sit in silence, sadness, realizing that he did this for us. But sometimes we can sit in joy. So today we party. We're not celebrating death. We're celebrating hope and joy and true love. So what we do is if somebody come up and take the cup and take it back to your seat, we'll go through it and just sit in silence for a few minutes thanking God what he's done for you, okay? Let's do that.
For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. To remember him. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. To remember him. Father God, there is great joy in what you've done for us. There's, there's also some intense emotions, but there's great joy. There's joy in our salvation. There's joy in sacrifice. There's joy in the fact that we can now turn around and reflect you. I would ask that we would be a church of individuals and together we would reflect you in everything we do in serving our community, in loving people, in loving the world. And we remember your sacrifice. And maybe someday, like Paul, we'll be able to say, well, I want to suffer with him. Because right now that seems so intense. We're thankful for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so just a few announcements. Uh, first, Pastor Marty, thank you for for that message this morning. Uh, kind of uh, kind of convicting to me because I'm one of his boys, and he says he complains, but honestly, it's usually me complaining. So uh, thanks for for that challenge this morning. Uh, am I the only one? I mean, hello, the only one that complains. Yeah, we all complain. Uh, but a couple announcements, real quick. Uh, here's a few things that are happening here at Chapin. Um, eight, Monday, April 4th, so uh, tomorrow, uh, it's the first Monday of the month. It's our prayer night. That will be from 6 to 7 p.m. No specific agenda. Um, come, praise, pray, um, lift up the, the prayers and needs of our community. Uh, let us know what, what you would need and uh, have a time together praying for, for one another in our communities. Thursday, April 7th is a ladies' night out. It's a uh, move it, so I believe that is an exercise night. There's a flyer right outside uh, on your way out. That is on Thursday the 7th from 6 to 8. Saturday, April 9th, we have our food and coat drive from 10 to 12. Also on Saturday the 9th, we have our, our work day. Uh, there is work that will be done outside as well as inside, and that's from 8 a.m. till 2 p.m., uh, Friday, April 15th is Good Friday. There, here in Holden, there is a combined um, service. It's a Good Friday service. That goes from 12 till 3. Uh, then Sunday, April 17th, we have Easter here. I'm really excited for that. We have three service times, 6 a.m. So for those of you that are really weird and like to get, I'm just kidding. Uh, sunrise service will be happening this year. Last year was the first time that uh, I had participated in that. It was really beautiful really great. Uh, so 6 a.m., 9 a.m., and then 10.30 a.m. Uh, so certainly in, uh, plenty of opportunities for us to invite friends and family to be, be here with us. Uh, so for our giving, uh, thank you so much. Honestly, thank you for the way that you give faithfully. Thank you for giving uh, sacrificially. I know not all of us are uh, independently wealthy and can just give millions of dollars if you do that. That's fantastic. But if you're like any other normal person, and each week you're like, all right, God, I need you to show up and I got to pay the bills and I want to do what's right and what you instruct me to do. I just want to give you a shout out. God sees it. God knows it. 
and I will tell you this, God will always provide. So please continue giving. Uh, you can give a couple ways. There's an offering box on your way out. There is uh, an online, a way to give online, chaplain.church slash giving. Uh, and you can also text any amount to the number 84321. Literally, it's that simple. Type in 84321, the amount you want to give, and it gives you a prompt. Um, that's all I got. We're going to close out in a song. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We'll, uh, we'll see you a little later. Hey, you guys can uh, go ahead and stand and join us one more time in musical worship. Another reminder, friendly reminder, it is International Party Day, National Party Day. So go out, have a good time, spend some time with us here, Fellowship Hour downstairs. We'd love to hang out, get to know you. Um, have a great day. See you next week.